Well, good morning again, community. And again, thank you to all those who've been participating to help us stay connected and the, those who've sent in those photos that we can put those out for people to see one another. And as I mentioned earlier, if you don't mind today, just get your device out when the service is ended and do a greetings, uh, film it for us, put it on video and just say good morning community from whomever you are and then let me know and I'll send you a link so we can upload those and then share those during our time of announcements so we can greet one another. Um, we're going to be today looking at a couple of more of the one another passages, uh, but by way of introduction, I think it's interesting that the experts are now writing about the secondary consequences of the current restrictions imposed upon us because of COVID-19. I don't think it's going to surprise you that leading the way are stress and fear. And stress and fear can be very, very harmful. There can be several and severe outcomes, um, not limited to, but it can include things like digestive issues hair and skin problems, eating and sleep disorders. Cardiovascular disease can occur because of stress and fear, which would include high blood pressure, abnormal heart rhythms, and even heart attacks. And there are many, many, many mental health complications that arise from stress and fear, things like anxiety and depression. And because of that, there can be acts of desperation in which people not only try and harm themselves, but in some cases, try and end it all. And the stress and fear that comes upon us during this time can greatly impact our relationships. Um, we, as a result of these things, we can be insensitive and rude to one another. We can be impatient with one another. We can be critical and intolerant of one another. And we can be unkind to one another. And I think this especially occurs with the things that we say to one another, the words that we use, the way that we speak to one another. And I hope this isn't happening in our homes. I hope that our homes are, are filled with God's grace and that our words reflect that. But sadly, sometimes our words are unkind toward one another. And perhaps during this time, even more so. And so we need to be careful. We know the explanation of a child is not sufficient. That sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We know this just simply isn't true. Words really do hurt. And part of the reason is the origin of unwholesome and unkind words. I know we're still in our introduction today, but I do want you to turn with me to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. I know you know this passage, but I think it's important for us to be reminded of the source of unkind, unwholesome, ungodly words. This is James chapter 3. I'm in verse 5 right now. And he says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not be so. So we see the source is the hell itself. The instrument that produces speech is our tongue. And if it's not under the control of the Holy Spirit, then it spits forth the venom from hell. And we curse those who are created in the image of God. Today I'd like for us to consider two more one another's. And both of these have to do with our speech, the things that we say. The first one is found in James. We'll be reminded that we should not speak evil against one another. And then we'll turn our attention to 1 Peter, and we'll be reminded that by way of contrast, we should minister to one another. And again, we'll find that that includes our speech. I hope today we are reminded that our speech needs to be sanctified. If we're going to be a blessing to others, and if we're going to give glory to God. And again, we'll explore not only what we're not supposed to do, but what we are to do. And my prayer is that today God might grant to us wisdom to know how to speak to one another. If you're there now in James, just turn over to the next chapter, James chapter 4. I'd like to read verses, just two verses, 11 and 12. And this will begin our study today as we consider our speech. If you have the ability, I encourage you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is James chapter 4, just two verses, 11 and 12. James says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. 
He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. And there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We recognize that it's living and active and it has the ability to cut deep within. And Lord, that's what we need today. We, we need your word to instruct us of what is true and right, to inform us how our speech should be pleasing to you. But Lord, we also confess today we need your spirit. We need your spirit to come over us, work in us, and we might work out your truth that our speech, we would know how to hold our tongue. And then when we do speak, Lord, that our words would be fitting of you and your goodness and your glory. Please work today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we begin with what James says, do not speak evil to one another or of one another. And the simplest of idea in this passage is the idea of against. That is to say, we must not use our words against one another. We must not be combative. We must not harm one another with our words. We should not slander one another, nor should we verbally attack one another. It is unacceptable for us to use our words to malign one's character, to assassinate one's integrity, and to seek to diminish one's influence. And it is definitely wrong for us to assign anyone to condemnation with our words. Now, these types of words are typically false and malicious, but even in the event that what we want to say is truthful, even if it is actually good criticism, that must be done without animosity, nor in a manner that harms someone else. You know, I was thinking to myself, how might I illustrate this today? And I thought, if I am too precise and too particular, then I could actually use my words today in a manner that's not befitting. So I thought, how can I give a general explanation or general illustration? And so without naming anyone in particular, I think sadly, there's a group of individuals, not all of them, but many of them, that use their words to harm others. And they are our leaders today, oftentimes politicians. And they'll come off with grand, grand they, they sound good, but oftentimes they are on the attack of their opponents. And, and sometimes it's right out malicious, but other times it's cloaked almost with the idea of, of humility. That's not what we want to do. We don't want to be those who attack one another. And by the way, there's never a need to fabricate. There's coming a day in which all mouths will be shut because all are guilty before God. If you have determined that you must speak against someone, then speak the truth because there's always plenty of truth to state. But can I add this thought? Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to do that when we consider God who has not spoken against us, but has rather spoken His grace to us? And, and don't think for a moment just because you do it when no one is around, no one knows. God knows every idle word that we speak, even when those who we are attacking are not present to defend themselves. When you and I as believers enter into speaking evil against one another, then we as Christians are not being controlled by the Holy Spirit, but rather by the flesh. And in that moment, we are carnal. We are living like unbelievers. And it shouldn't surprise us that unbelievers would speak evil. It will occur because they are led about by the prince of darkness. But remember, we are the children of light, and our speech must be different. Furthermore, let me remind us that we will be impacted if we make it our regular practice to listen to such ungodly speech. And as I mentioned that, I am talking about the music to which we listen, the movies and shows that we watch, and the company we keep. Garbage in, garbage out is still a standard formula for failure. And we don't want to be numbered among fools. So be careful what you listen to. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10. The Lord has given us His wisdom in the Old Testament as well as it relates to our speech. Proverbs chapter 10, I'm at verse 18. And notice the contrasts that are set up in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18 and following. Whoever hides hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. In, a, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. 
but he who restrains his lips is wise. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is worth little. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for a lack of wisdom. Now again, I'm trying to think of how I might illustrate this, and I don't want to be specific, but what does it sound like? A women, you unfortunately know what it is to enter into words that are unwholesome, ungodly, unkind. As you talk about other women, you might comment about their attire or about their children, and you'll do it in a way that doesn't bring glory to God. Men do the same thing. Our, our topics, though, are a little different. It might be about the car that another fella drives, or perhaps about how he's not doing very well in the workplace. Parents, you can do this with your children. When you compare your children to your other children and you make comments like, why can't you be more like your brother or you're just like your sister? Or when you make comments like, how many times do I have to tell you the same thing? And if you're trying to get a count on that, then just think about the number of times that God has told you the same thing. Children, you can do this as well. When you say things like, my parents just don't get me. They don't understand me. I wish I had other parents. And as friends, we can do the same thing. When we tell another friend that their opinion doesn't matter, what they think we really don't care about. And by the way, it can also turn into spiritual slander even when we're sharing prayer requests. When we share those requests in a manner that's unbecoming, when we actually are critiquing and judgmental rather than praying, and we speak evil against one another. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time on the negative today, but I'm still not yet done. There's something else I think that's important for us to understand. Why is this so important? Why is it so critical that we do not speak words against one another? It would be sufficient for us to say because it's a sin against one another, but I want to remind you, go back to James, that it's even more critical because it's not just a sin against one another. It's actually an assault against God himself. Listen again to what James wrote in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother, listen to this, speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. And here's the assault. There is but one lawgiver, one lawgiver who's able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Now, before I explain this part, let me remind you that it's okay for us to speak God's standards and God's judgments. In other words, we do not speak evil against someone if we announce, here's God's standard, here is God's judgment. If we tell someone that lying is wrong and they should stop lying, and if they've been lying, they should confess it as sin, that's not inappropriate. It's not slanderous. However, even when we do that, when we announce God's judgments, God's laws, it's important how we do it. We have to do it in a manner. We have to do it with love, graciously. We have to consider ourselves, our own weaknesses. We better check and make sure there isn't a log in our own eye that needs to be addressed first. But when we go outside of God's Word, when we offer our own judgments, when we offer our own standards, when we offer our own critique of individuals, then what we have done is we have elevated ourselves. And we are trying to assume the throne of God. And oftentimes we'll do this when we don't feel good about ourselves. We'll try and put other people down, take God off the throne, move ourselves up there, and that makes us feel better about ourselves. But rather remember that God alone is always on the throne. And as it relates to one another, we should treat them as more important than ourselves and lower ourselves. So it's the exact opposite with godly speech. Not to elevate self, but to lower self and to be a servant. And again, it's never our role to assume the throne of God. That is His alone. Now, I know I've spent a lot of time on the prohibition, but I am convinced as believers we really don't want to tear one another down. So let me provide in a couple of moments what would be appropriate words. And for this, I'd have us to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to break in at verse 7. And a reminder again, the time is of the essence. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. And boy, we pray, come Lord Jesus. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Begin in prayer. 
And above all things, have fervent love for one another. That's the foundational truth, love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. And be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As stewards of the manifold grace of God. If one speaks, and here's the thought, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So rather than taking God's place, we should receive and fulfill the stewardship that God has given us from on high. And here specifically our speech should be as the oracles of God. When you and I speak, it should be as the oracles of God. What does this mean? It means that our speech should originate from the Bible. Our speech should be befitting and defined by Scripture. So in other words, our words should be that which at the very least would accomplish the purposes of God as He speaks. And in Scripture, and I've given you several passages to consider in your bulletin, our words should accomplish at least one of these four purposes, if not all of them. Number one, our words should admonish. Number two, our words should exhort. Number three, our words should edify. And number four, our words should comfort. Again, our words should admonish, exhort, edify, and or comfort. We should admonish one another with our words. That means we speak the truth. We speak the truth to instruct someone as to what they should do or actually to warn them, if they don't do the right thing, what the outcome will be. We should exhort one another. This is a degree of challenging one another, but not a provocation to evil. But rather, we're calling them out to godliness. Our words should edify. That is the idea of building. We build upon the foundation, which is Christ Jesus the Lord, and we're adding to that brick and mortar, brick and mortar, until they are strong in the Lord to withstand the trials of life. And our words should comfort. Words should soothe. Words should relieve. In times of sadness, times of pain, in times of sorrow, and in times of death. Admonish, exhort, edify, and comfort. If you want to get more specific, if you want to know exactly what to say, go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. There's a parallel passage found in Ephesians, but let's go to Colossians chapter 3 and notice what Paul says here about the words that we use, how we should use them for the benefit of one another. This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and following. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And here's the content. Here's what we should say to one another. Sing to one another psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So specifically, what should be the, our speech? What should be our phrases, our sentences? Well, we should be singing to one another, stating to one another psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, what is this? Well, Psalms specifically would be Old Testament Psalms, but it can be expanded to anything that is Scripture. Whatever the Scripture states, say that to one another. Hymns. Hymns refer to the songs that we use to declare theology and doctrine. So today we sang a song, The Solid Rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is shifting sand. That's a song of theology. That's a hymn of doctrine. And then spiritual songs speak about our experience. And we sang songs like that today as well. I'm no longer a slave of fear. I am a child of God. This is what God has done. He's moved us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His glorious Son. So this is our experience. So what is it we should say to one another? Take the words that we use when we gather for worship and use those words, use those sentences to speak to one another. Now this could get kind of interesting. Um, it, to try and come up with, every time someone speaks to you, come up with a lyric from a song. Um, I'll give you one idea. If you have a teenage son right now who's been sleeping in past noon, when he gets out of bed, sing him an Easter song. Up from the grave he arose. And I'm sure his heart will be encouraged and everyone will delight that you're singing a song to him. Now, I think it's probably unlikely 
that we're going to quote songs to one another when we talk, although I think it would be fun to do that. So may I suggest considering the inverse of that? The inverse. What do I mean by that? Consider the words that you speak to one another. Think just even about a conversation you had this last week. Think about how you said things, the way you said things. And now what I want you to think about is could you use that conversation right now with other believers to sing and give praise to God? If the way that we speak to one another cannot be used in a corporate gathering to worship God, then I would suggest it's time for us to consider our speech and how we talk to one another. Whatever we say should give glory to God, individually and even corporately. So examine what you say. Could you sing that and give praise to God? If our speech is ever to arrive at that standard, then we must saturate our minds with the Word of God. His Word must dwell in us richly in all wisdom. And then we will realize our minds are saturated with His Word when we are making melody <coughs> in our hearts rather than being unsettled. We will find our minds to be saturated with His Word when we are thankful rather than discouraged. And we will know our minds are saturated with His Word when we bless others rather than speak evil against them, speak evil of them. Now with that, I just have two final thoughts today as I consider this topic. First of all, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 states and reminds us that there is a time to speak and a time to be silent. I think this is oftentimes when an individual is considered wise when they don't speak. But if we must speak, then our words must be speaking the truth in love. Both are important, the truth and in love. And when we are silent, and we know there are times for that, when we have a friend who needs us just to sit in the ashes, when someone is struggling. And there are those occasions, as Peter points out, to even godly wives, those times when all of us, sometimes the best thing to do is to be quiet and let our conduct do the work rather than our words. But then my next thought is this. If any of this is going to take place, if our words are going to be befitting, if our speech is going to be a blessing and a praise to God, then we desperately need God to be in control of our tongues. As James has already mentioned, it's an unruly evil. Men can tame anything, but the tongue, it cannot be done. God alone must be in control. And I'm convinced as Christians, we want our words to be beneficial to one another. We want them to be pleasing to the Lord. So I would like to suggest that we find a prayer in Psalm today that we ought to pray as it relates to our speech. Go with me to Psalm 141 and we'll close out with this passage. It's an interesting psalm. It's given to us from the Lord through David. And it's the cry of David. What I find interesting is he's making his appeal to God and then turns his attention immediately, not to his enemies, but to that enemy within, the tongue. This is what David writes, Psalm 141. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Right away we know this is important to him. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So in the context, this is important. And in context, this is a matter of worship. This is a matter of blessing and praising God's name. And what is the immediate content, his concern? Verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. If I'm going to give you praise, if I'm going to offer to you what is due, I need you to be in control of my speech. This is my desperate cry. And if that's to take place, David understood it begins within, within where our affections and our passions and our desires lie. And he says in verse 4, Do not incline my heart to any evil thing practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. Do, let, do not let me eat of their delicacies. Lord, we do need you to be at work. We know it has to begin in our affections. So we ask you, please, do not let us enter into temptation. Let us not be tempted by the evil one. 
and set our affections upon you. Help us to be wise with those with whom we associate and the things that we watch and to what we listen. Help us to understand those things impact us. But Lord, as those things begin to stir within, as we do struggle and we will at times, and Lord, I pray that you would shut our mouths, that our lips would be touched shyly, t- shut tightly, Lord, that it would not come out. And then, Lord, that you would work in such a way to reorient our thoughts, our affections, and that the words which would come out, Lord, would be a blessing to others and give you praise and glory. I pray, Lord, that you work for your glory and for the good of your people. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.